I'm inviting you, please, this morning to open your Bible with me in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. As you pray, do remember us as we start a gospel mission over there in Kilkeel, a tent, or in Kilkeel, in Rich Hill, uh, the Lord willing, next Sunday, Sunday afternoon, and then right through for the following two weeks. Pray the Lord will give to us not only good weather, but if there are going to be showers, pray that there'll be showers of blessing and that God will come down. How we need a mighty move of God in our land and in our nation. It seems to be that abomination is abounding on every part. The laws that are being introduced by our government, my friend, they make us tremble in the presence of God. But we've got to believe that God is over all. He is on the throne. The Bible says, why do the heathen rage? The people imagine vain things. The rulers of this earth, the kings of this earth, Take counsel together against God and against His Christ. But the Bible says, God is in the heavens. He shall have them in derision. He is the one who ultimately will exalt His Son. So we've got to believe that in spite of all that's happening, God is still on the throne. And He overrules in the affairs of men. Pray that God will turn the tide and send to us a mighty revival. That's not the sermon. Let's turn to the reading of the Word of God this morning as we see it in Mark chapter 2. It's speaking of the Lord Jesus when it says this word, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why, doth this, uh, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is, is it greater to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorifying God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And amen, God always blesses to us the reading of His sacred word. Just at the moment, during these last number of days, my heart has been stirred because I'm currently writing a book on the history of the welcome Evangelical Church in Cambariah Street on the Shankill Road in Belfast. The roots of that church really reach back to the county town coast, the little village of Malisle. It was into the Carmichael family that their eldest girl was born, Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael, of course, for many years was a fantastic missionary in, in India, rescuing especially girls, thousands of girls, from prostitution and poverty and seeing them brought into the kingdom of God. However, as a young girl of 15 years of age, Amy Carmichael trusted Jesus Christ, the Savior. She was at a private school in Harrogate, Yorkshire, England, when a children's mission, such as you're going to have here, and the evangelist had the joy of leading young Amy to Jesus Christ. Amy Carmichael, as we were speaking to the boys and girls this morning, was not just content to have Jesus Christ in her heart. She wanted that light to shine. And while she was still a young girl when she returned to Belfast, she uh, was reaching out to the community in Belfast. 
not only of the elite, because she came from a very good family. They lived on College Gardens, Malone Road. They traveled to church, the Rosemary Street Presbyterian Church, on their carriage every week. Not so with Amy. Amy wanted to reach the people where they were on the street, speak to them about the Lord. She started a Bible class on a Sunday morning amongst the mill girls whom they called the shawlies, the ladies who, girls who put the shawl over them to cover their heads and cover their, their poor clothing. On a Sunday morning, she led hundreds of these girls to Jesus Christ. So much so that at her Bible class, she had 500 shawlies, mill girls, learning the scriptures, and one by one, she led them to the Savior. I say all of that this morning because it was Amy Carmichael who wrote those words, Oh, for a passionate passion for souls. Oh, for a pity that yearns. Oh, for a love that loves unto death. Oh, for a fire that burns. Amy Carmichael had a passion for souls. Not only, my friend, as she would go to India, but as a teenager on the streets of Belfast. A passion that got her down out of the carriage and, and onto the streets. Helped her to lift the poor and embrace those, my friend, who were despised in the community. And one by one, she led them to the personal saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Can I say to you this morning that a passionless Christian is a Christian who has left their first love. It is a contradiction of terms, my friend, to say that you're a Christian and yet remain apathetic, half-hearted, refusing, as we have said this morning, to, to burn for Jesus Christ. The old hymn that says, O Lord, this world is lost in sin, and few there are who care, many of whom profess thy name, no burden will help to bear. We need a passion, Lord, for souls. To bring the lost back to thee, our hearts must be stirred until all have heard at least once of Calvary. Let me burn out for thee, dear Lord. Burn and wear out for thee. Don't let me rust or my life be a hindrance, my God, to thee. Take me and all I have, dear Lord, and get me so close to thee till I feel the throb of the great heart of God and my life burns out for thee. My friend, can I say that here at the Baptist Tabernacle in Kilkeel this morning, what we all need as Christians is a passion for souls, a passion for Christ, a passion for the Scriptures, a passion for His glory, a passion for a great revival. Having said all of that this morning and coming to your church today in the midst of this gospel mission, I felt constrained to come again to this portion of Scripture, a familiar portion of Scripture that takes us to the sleepy little town of Capernaum on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. It is the town to which our blessed Lord Jesus resorted, having left Nazareth and made Capernaum his center for the ministry in all of Galilee. In this portion of Scripture, it not only reminds us of our Lord Jesus coming to Capernaum, but the Bible tells us that he came to a certain house and it was noised abroad that Jesus was in that house. I find it quite amazing that the Bible doesn't tell us whose house it belonged to. The Bible doesn't tell us how big the house was or how well the house was furnished. It doesn't tell us the value of the house. But it does tell us the most important thing about that house, and it was simply this, that Jesus Christ was there. My friend, can I say to all of us this morning, the most important thing about our homes is to know that Jesus is there. It was noised abroad that Jesus was in the house. When we see here in this town of Capernaum that the Lord Jesus was there, how important that was, and and yet, with our blessed Lord being there, we, we understand not only Christ was there, but the crowds were there. Mark chapter 1 and verse 28 reminds us that in Galilee, when word spread around, his fame spread around all of Galilee, why, he was a subject on every tongue. 
He, my friend, was the conversation of every table. And when people heard that Jesus was there, why the crowds, the crowds, they came. Some, some came to hear him. The Bible tells us that they heard him gladly, for never man speak like this man. He spoke with authority. Our Lord Jesus, my friend, was not only a great storyteller, he told the truth. He, he taught them in such a way that they understood. They came to hear him. Others, others not only came to hear, some came for healing. The Bible reminds us, my friend, again in Mark chapter 1, that before the end of the day, they brought on to him those who suffer from divers' diseases. That means all sorts of diseases. We understand of our blessed Lord that there was never a case that ever stumped him. He was never, my friend, found wanting when it came to any situation. The Lord Jesus always was, and incidentally, he always is greater than all of our difficulties. Some came to hear him. Some came for healing. Can I say that some came to harass him? Some came to hinder him? And that is why we understand not only were the crowds there, but we understand the critics were there. The Bible tells us that as our Lord Jesus was in that house healing a paralytic, why they, they were criticizing him. Isn't it amazing, my friend, that wherever God is working, uh, we are never short of critics, uh, those who will complain. It seems to be, my friend, that as we were speaking this morning of a light in the darkness, it oftentimes does attract the bugs. Isn't that the truth? And God's work is not without the critics. Here the critics came. And the amazing thing is, they were criticizing because of the miracles that God was doing. Not just healing of the paralytic, but the Lord Jesus indicated that the greater miracle was not making a man to walk. The greater miracle was for giving a man his sins. My friend, can I say that is still the greatest miracle of grace today? To see a man or woman, a boy or girl, come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior and experience the miracle of God's grace in their heart, whereby their sins are forgiven, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Heaven, they're bound for the glory land. That is a miracle of grace. And the Bible tells us that in spite of those miracles of grace, why, the critics were there, the crowds, the Christ. Uh, but can I remind you this morning, the crippled man was there. Uh, he is the whole focus besides our Lord in this story. A man, my friend, who was crippled from birth, a paralytic, absolutely helpless. And here he is, absolutely cast upon our Lord. I say some came from healing. May I just remind you, my friend, that we live in a world that is crippled by sin. We have mental critics, my mental cripples, can I say, mental and moral cripples. We have people, my friend, in our society today who are paralyzed with prejudice. Others, my friend, who are crippled with corruption. It abounds in society today. And as Steve Green wrote many years ago, all around us, there are people who need the Lord. Isn't, isn't that the truth? Uh, listen to what he wrote. Every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private uh, pain. Living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. My friend, our neighbors need the Lord. People in our street, people in our community, they need the Lord. The Christ was there. The crowds were there. The critics were there. The cripples were there. However, besides our blessed Lord Jesus, I want to draw your attention this morning of the compassionate who were there. We read in our Bible reading this morning these words that there were four men, look at verse 3, and they come unto him bringing one sick of the palsy which was born of four. In the midst of the crowd and the compassionate and incidentally even the careless. I say the careless because while the crowds crowded in to hear Christ, 
There was only a minority who took time to think of the man who was on the street, a crippled man. He was, these were compassionate people, compassionate men. I say that to you this morning because may I just remind you, if we would be filled with passion, we've got to know what is compassion. Compassion, my friend, is just love in action, love that does something. The Bible tells us that when our Lord Jesus saw the multitudes, a sheep without a shepherd, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. That is a passion that not only stirred his heart, it activated his hands, it motivated his feet. He had to do something. My friend, can I say how true that is? To have a passion for souls in our community is to make sure that we do something. These men had this compassion uh, first of all, because of two things. First of all, because of the necessity of the paralyzed man. This paralyzed man, by virtue of his paralysis, he couldn't help himself. He had no legs to take him to Christ. He had no one else to help him. My friend, may I just remind you of the cripples of our society today, so prejudiced with uh, so prejudiced the against the gospel of Jesus Christ, they will not come to the house of God so prejudiced in their views that they will not take time to read the Word of God. That is why we have got to be moved with compassion to see their need. They can't see that need for themselves. The Bible tells us that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those who are lost. And then the Bible says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine in upon them. They don't see their need. They don't see, my friend, their danger. That is why we as Christians, we've got to see what God sees and feel what God felt and do, my friend, what God wants us to do to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, lift them in pity from sin in the grave. That was these, these uh, compassionate men. They were moved with compassion because of the need, the necessity of the man. Not only were they moved with compassion because of the uh, necessity of the man, but also because of the opportunity. Jesus is right here at this moment. And my friend, what an opportunity it was when you meet a man with the necessity of paralysis and here with the opportunity of bringing him to Christ. Isn't that what a gospel mission is all about? It, my friend, is not only occupying the banks and the, the seats uh, night after night, but rather it's, it's seeking to bring others to the Savior. It's doing what God wants us to do. And I say to you this morning that as we stand before God, God knows that our message is the gospel itself. Our master is the Savior himself. Our motive our motive, my friend, is the very love of Christ, this passion that constrains us. When I speak of these four men of compassion, I want to underline that compassion this morning. First of all, can I say this, that these men had a committed compassion. It wasn't just that they looked upon the, uh, the man in his necessity and saw the Lord Jesus in the house. This is our opportunity. Their compassion motivated them, as I've already said. It activated them to actually do something. It is putting legs on their love for souls to get them out into the community and bring that man to where Jesus is. My friend, Dr. Bill Woods, when God called him to the work, well, way back in 1959, when he called him to the work of Acre Gospel Mission, sailed to Brazil in 1960. He worked with us in the little town of Kanotama in the heart of the Amazon jungle. While there, one day, a young man, a man who had been suffering of, of snake bite, was brought from the upper reaches of the river Mokoween. And when they brought him down to the mouth of the river, they called Bill. Bill had no medical training. The nearest doctor was three, three uh, weeks, uh, sorry, three hours away by aeroplane or Ten days away by boat. When Bill went to see this, this poor fellow, he was writhing in pain. The, the, the 
the snake bite on the leg had already set in gangrene. The, the leg, the flesh was falling from the bone. The stench was terrible. And Bill, without medicine, without experience, what could he do? And to the man who was screaming and his screams echoing into the night, Bill says, what I'll do, sir, is I'll pray for you. The guy cried and said, I don't want you to pray. I want you to, I want you to do something. I want you to do something. Bill, through those cries, he tried to pray with the man, but even as he prayed his prayers, it seemed were being drowned by the screams of the man as he left that little house on the side of the river, making his way back up river. He could hear the echoes into the night, crying and screaming, I want you to do something. Bill Wood said, before God, God help me, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something for these suffering people. And that is, my friend, what motivated him to go and study Portuguese in a foreign language. Having finished medicine, uh, study medicine rather, in the Portuguese language. Having finished medicine to study ophthalmology, go to India and study reconstructive surgery. And now for almost 40 years, he's been doing something. Why? Because it just wasn't that passion that, that felt within his heart. He had to put legs to his love and actually be committed to do something. I say that here this morning because I wonder what challenge comes to you in the midst of this mission, in the midst of this town of Kilkeel. To reach, as it were, excuse me, rep repeating this word, but reaching the crippled sinners for Christ who cannot and will not come. I wonder would someone be committed with a compassion to do something? These men were not only compassionate men, but they had a committed compassion to do something. Not only was their compassion committed, my friend, can I say that their compassion was, was creative. They decided that they would do something that no one else had ever done in their lives before. When this crippled man on the outside was brought from the street, the Bible tells us they couldn't get him in because of the crowds. The crowds were on the inside, listening in the presence of the Lord Jesus. How can we get them in? Why, well, these three men decided to do something that no one had ever done before. The Bible says that they climbed up onto the roof, and they took the roof off. And they let the man down from the roof into the presence of the Lord Jesus. They were to do something that no one else had ever done before. As a matter of fact, we read these words at the end of our reading where it says, we never saw it on this fashion. Isn't that amazing? My friend, I do honestly feel in the day in which we live that sometimes our traditional mold sort of binds us. We tend to think that the gospel will only be preached at 7 o'clock on a Sunday night. That's not true. This Bible reminds me in the book of Acts that every day, daily, they went from house to house speaking, testifying, preaching Christ. And the Bible says that day after day, God was adding to the church such as should be saved. Don't you feel that we've got to be creative in reaching the lost for Christ? Yesterday morning, we were at a season of prayer for every home crusade, and thank God for that fantastic work. It is amazing, my friend, all over our world that the printed page is getting into communities Towns, villages, where there is no seven o'clock Sunday morning service. But the printed page is doing a work in homes. The power of the Word of God, at least touching the hearts of men and women. Maybe it is for that reason, my friend, we've got to think outside the box and think of maybe bringing them to our homes. Sometimes we do it on what we call a coffee morning or or maybe it will be on some, I'm not sure how, how you'll go about it. Do you know that Robert Rakes, Robert Rakes was a man who lived 250 years ago in the city of Gloucester. In his day, there was no such a thing as a Sunday school. Nobody ever thought of a Sunday school until Robert Rakes. He saw that boys and girls went to school on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And he thought, why don't we start a Sunday school? Nobody goes to, church, uh, goes to school on Sunday. So he started, my friend, the Sunday school movement 250 years ago. 
And through the Sunday school movement, my friend, hundreds of boys and girls have been won for Christ. That's why we thank God for people like our brother who's coming this week will go into schools and, and into where the children are. Those have to come to ch church. It's reaching them where they are. Why? These compassionate men, they were committed to do something. They were creative in what they did. Another thing, can I say this? In their compassion, they were not only committed and creative, they were cooperative. We read that there were four of them. Can I suggest to you this morning that to get this man, this paralyzed man, out of the streets of Capernaum and into the presence of the Lord Jesus, one of them could not have done it on his own. I mean, for one of them to carry the paralyzed man and, and take him up to the roof and, and take off the roof and let him down, it was too much work for one man. Four of them were needed. Can you imagine that uh, four of them all come to take the stretcher? And uh, those of you who have been in St. John's, you will know what it is, that uh, one in each corner, they're going to hold the stretcher and carry this man to Christ. Can you think of the confusion it would be if one of them turned that direction, we're going that direction, and the other said, no, I don't agree with you, I'm turning my back, I'm going that direction. Why? The four men, my friend, they had to be cooperative. They, they had to have the same aim, have the same commitment, go in the same direction, and all do the one work. Sometimes when it comes to God's work, my friend, we're so divided by opinions that many Christians refuse to work together. I think I've told here at Kilkeel before, traveling on the Amazon, on one of the tributaries of the Amazon, and a, a woman, I give her a, a tin, and she came back and gave me a, a plate with a big half a turtle all covered with blood. And, and of course, she was being very kind to me. And, and uh, I said to her, how much does it cost, Senora? She says, it doesn't cost anything. You give me a tin, I give you the turtle. But, but the tin, it's an empty tin, it didn't cost. How much does it? No, no, no. You give me, I, she said, young man, and I was younger then, uh, young man, you've got to learn that in this life, you need one hand to wash the other. When I left that simple home at the side of the jungle, I thought of what that woman said, how true it is. I don't do many things with my left hand, but when it comes to washing the right hand, the right hand needs the left hand. When it comes to the body of Christ, can I tell you, my friend, that the arm needs a leg? Someone has said that what the eye can see, the hand cannot see, but the hand can do. What the hand can do may be important, but the hand can't get there without the feet. Every part of the body functions to the one body. My friend, can I say that's how it is in the work of Christ. Christ has called us to one body. And the Bible reminds me, my friend, that we've got to be cooperative in the work of God. It doesn't mean to say that we've got to be uniform about everything that we think. But if we have a commitment to Christ and a compassion for the lost, it will motivate us to be cooperative in reaching the loss for Jesus Christ. Oh, for a passionate passion for souls. Oh, for a pity that yearns these men. These men were cooperative in what they did. Can I say something else about their compassion? These men, my friend, in that compassion, they were confident. They were confident that if we can get this man to Christ, Christ has got the answer to his problem. And isn't that the truth when it comes to evangelism? Oh, if only we could get them to the Savior. If only we could make them see. If only we could make them feel. And my friend, can I say that is true? Thank God the Bible has got the answer to every problem. I remember many years ago, an old brigadier general of the British Army speaking to us as young fellows going out to mission fields, some going to Thailand and Japan and India, the old brigadier said, remember these words, fellas. Wherever you go with the gospel of Jesus Christ, let's remember on the inside of every man, there is something that will be touched by the truth of the gospel. That is why the Bible says of Jesus Christ that he is the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. And a man, my friend, on our street may profess to be an atheist or agnostic, but I'll tell you this, when the Word of God, with its mighty impact, is sown into that man's heart, 
into that man's hearing. The Word of God will do its own work and touch the people. We've got to believe that. The Apostle Paul in his day, the Bible reminds us that he was fearless in his defense of the gospel and said these words, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. He wrote those words to the Romans. Listen, Rome was a citadel of political power. He was writing it in the Greek language, Athens. Athens was the seat of intellectual prowess. He was writing it, my friend, not just to Gentiles, but to Jews. Why, Jews, with all the authority of the Talmud, they brought all the authority of religion, my friend, in political power, in intellectual prowess, and all the traditions of the, the, the religion of the Jews, says the Apostle Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the mighty power of God unto salvation. That is why as Christians, my friend, it's not a philosophy that we're bringing to change a civilized world. We're bringing the message of the gospel to touch individual lives and see men and women brought to Christ. We've got to have confidence in the power of the gospel of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. And, and here are these men who not only had love in action, they had faith in action. If we can get them to Christ, Christ can do something. Our time is gone. Can I say just two other things quite briefly about it? Their compassion was committed, creative, cooperative, confident. Their compassion, my friend, was courageous. Can you imagine those critics, those complainers, when they saw these fellows going up the roof and, and opening the roof? Don't you hear the criticisms? Sometimes it takes courage to stand against public opinion. Sometimes, even as Christians, to, to do something. I remember before I went to the mission field, I met Ernie Allen. I was only a boy, 18, 19 years of age. But Ernie Allen, when I met him, the first thing he did, he gave me a bundle of books and literature and said, I want you to do every home in Dunmurray with the gospel of Christ. And so it was at the beginning of every home crusade, going to every door in Dunmurray. Some days I got the door slammed on my face. Sometimes I almost got spat at. But I'll tell you this, my friend, it really pays to stand for Jesus. The final thing I want to say about it is these men did have compassion. But that compassion was costly. I say costly because the Bible reminds us that these four men, they climbed onto the roof of the building and they tore up the roof of the house. Can you imagine the questions? Who's going to pay for the damage? Who's going to repair the roof? My friend, can I say of these men this morning, the most precious thing about that house was not the roof or the furniture. The most precious thing about that house is the man who is at the center of the story, one soul who needs Jesus. That's the worth of your soul. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The most precious thing that you possess in your life this morning is not the home in which you live or the car that you drive or the money in the bank. The most precious thing that you possess is your soul, your soul. And here is this man, here is this man, the most important thing about him to get him to Christ and to know that his sins are forgiven and get him to the kingdom, the cost. The cost will look after itself. Count Sindendorf stood in Dusseldorf at Fetty's painting, and as he looked at the crucified Christ, the painting was so graphic, it touched his heart. But more graphic still, as he drew near and saw under the painting these words, All this I did for thee. What hast thou done for me? Answer that question in your heart this morning. All this Christ has done for us. 
What have we done for him?